Okay, welcome everybody. I'm very excited for today's guest, Mr. Long Lee. Long is pursuing a, a doctorate of physical therapy and is hoping to enter that field. And he has some interesting questions. So I'm excited to actually learn from him today. And I think we're going to have a, you're in for a great conversation to go back and forth. So um, hope you guys tune in. Welcome, Long. Hello. Nice to be here. Yes, it is. So um, you have you have some questions for us, uh, for me today. Yeah, yeah. So like you said, I'm going into, well, right now I'm a pre-physical therapy student and I'm currently applying to physical therapy school. And so I just finished my undergraduate like degree and that's four years of grueling school. And so that's followed up with an additional three years which is what physical therapy school typically is in length. And so one of the questions I had was, what makes a successful student? And this doesn't have to be like specific to just school in general, because I know um, like we both come from the athletic training program at UCSB and you're a mentor to a lot of students. And in that sense, like you're a teacher there. And so there's a lot that makes up what a student is and what do you think makes someone like that successful yeah awesome first question um i think this is like a perfect question to set up episode three of this podcast jeremy alvarez tv because it's an opportunity for me to let all of you know let all the audience know a little bit more inside of me and so what I'd like to say, uh, what makes a good student, the first thing I think of is just showing up. I think that a, a good student is somebody who takes all of the opportunities to just be around for when knowledge and opportunities are laid out, right? There's a lot of opportunities that aren't necessarily planned. There's a lot of knowledge and experiences that are, aren't necessarily planned in our field, right? You know, sometimes mm -hmm. things, not sometimes, all the time, things happen all the time where a specific condition or case walks in the door and just because a student chose to be on time and to spend a little bit extra of their time when they're not in school to be there gained can gain valuable experience that's going to benefit them in the long run. So that's the first thing is just showing up. The second thing I would say is to seek out more coaches. Um, learning is beyond school, like I mentioned already. School is great because it provides you a level one understanding of the foundational knowledge that we need to be able to research and learn beyond school, right? So mm -hmm. a really quick example is now that I know a lot of uh, medical terminology, being an athletic trainer, it allows me for when I see evidence or when I'm having a discussion with another healthcare <laughs> professional, referring you know, my patient to a physician or somewhere else that it helps a ton that I'm able to speak on the same language and understand. It helps that I'm able to look at evidence and understand what is BS and what is not, right? It helps mm -hmm. that I can appraise that research and understand the external versus internal validity. How is this going to apply? Is it going to benefit and apply to my clinical practice? Is it going to translate over well, or does this not make sense at all? So I think what we learn in school, being a student is very important have to show up, have to be around to learn these things, but to have an understanding from the very beginning before you graduate, graduation's obviously, you know, an exciting time and people should cheer and be excited, right? It was a challenge, right? But they call it a commencement for a reason because you're just starting. You're, 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 oh, man. <laughs> you're, 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 com you're, you're commencing, right? You're, you're, you're about to go on this journey where the real learning is about to happen. Yeah. And so I think that's the best thing I can tell you, man. That, that's what makes a successful student. Um, 
one last thing I would say is that to have like have a takeaway. So when you're a successful student and you're around and you have the understanding that I'm learning foundational things, have a takeaway from that. In other words, find a little gem in what you've learned as a student, whether it's through a text, through evidence, through projects, through a person, through a peer, right? And 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 take that with you and make it better. Take that with you and use it to grow, right? I think mm-hmm. when you're a student, you have to understand that you know, a lot of times students think that they're not as good as their professors or they're not as good as, I don't know, they just feel less, right? And mm-hmm. and I think, and think in some ways, sure, that that's valid, right? Like sometimes professors have more, not sometimes, all the time professors have more experience, right? But that doesn't always mean, you know, somebody is necessarily going to be the one to discover the cure or a new method or, you know, have some great success, right, in your future. So I wouldn't, you know, down myself so much if I was a student, right? If I could go back to when I was an undergrad, I wouldn't let myself hear all the negativity and just and just feel down about it. Um, and by by doing that, in, in my experience, uh, from feeling that sometimes, and also having great experiences, I've learned to pay it forward, and that's something that I learned as a student. And so one day, what makes a successful student? One day you're not going to be a student, and in a lot of ways, you don't even realize it yourself that you have students yourself. <laughs> you know, you're already leading people yourself, so. The realization that you are you are in a leadership leadership position, right? Maybe not in one specific setting, maybe it's another setting, but to pay it forward, whatever knowledge, information, experience you get, pay it forward so that you can continue to grow as being a leader in yourself, right? Um, mm-hmm. So that's what I would say um, makes a successful student. I like that that first point you made where the first step is showing up because I think a lot of people may like show up physically and be there present, but they're not there mentally and they're not being completely present and trying to learn for themselves. Like a lot of people will go to class. Like this is definitely me in general chemistry, my first year of college where I would just show up and I was there for, you know, C's get degrees. You, I wasn't completely certain of what I would do specifically. I just knew I had to take this class. I was on this pre-bio path and I wasn't like completely set in stone on what I would do. And I guess what, what happened was I felt as though I wasn't learning for myself and I wasn't internalizing all of the knowledge for that reason. A lot of the people, like when I go to the athletic training room, I know that a lot of the time I'm investing is my own. And so I'm there intentionally to learn and I'm very present with everything that's around me. Like I know back in the past, I was very sort of dismissive with school. I would Mm. say I'm signing up for these classes because I need to, not exactly because I want to or if it's my own value or adds to my own value. And as I've gotten more mature, I'm starting to understand that these fundamental classes like chemistry play very important roles in our own field. I mean, it goes all the way down to the cellular and molecular levels. And so when I started learning about like movement and reading these fundamental books, and I wanted to get much more depth I started to learn about, say, um, like the composition of proteins in, say, a tendon or some fascia. And I'm learning about type 1, type 2 collagen. And then I'm learning about elastin. And then suddenly I'm looking at molecules. I'm like, God damn, I'm not I didn't listen in class. What was I doing? You know, and so I can't really apply these things that I sort of took for granted early on. And so being present isn't necessarily just, I guess, being there physically, but you you want to be there. You're there mentally and you're there with the express goal to learn 
for your own benefit and your own well-being. And I guess that comes with a lot of, you know, self-motivated, intrinsic, like, um, like goals, you know, it starts with your why, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Um, Something else you said I liked was um, you and your professors, like, sort of as collaborators. And that's something where I didn't exactly take this class, but I showed up for the first week because I wasn't sure whether or not I would stick with this one. But the professor said in the beginning, we are, although we are professors, students, we're collaborators at the same goal. And so I know working with you, you made a lot of your students feel the same way in that you say you learn a lot from your students every day. And that's not something I often hear from you know, supervisors and people of a higher level where they make the students feel as though they're, they have some meaningful input or have some meaningful value or provide um, alternative perspectives that a professor in the same field for many years may have not noticed, you know? And this this makes me think a lot of my roommate actually, just because he sometimes annoys me and like, I'll tell him a fact. Yeah, he's, I tell him a fact and he never accepts it. Like, I'll tell him, oh, this is this way. And he always questions it. And he does the same thing with his professors. He doesn't just assume that they know it. Like, they they just know it. He has to understand why. And I mm-hmm. guess that the reasoning behind that, like, it makes you understand things to a deeper level of depth. Because when you keep being questioned on the same topic over and over again, you slowly figure out how little you know. And it's very kind of shocking. Like you might know you know something until someone starts asking you questions. You're like, damn, I didn't (laughs) didn't know any of this stuff. I know that's what I love about this podcast is that I never want to prepare or know the questions. I just want to speak, you know, naturally. And and I think in the process, that's that's how I learn. And I think it's kind of a fun experience to share with our viewers as well. Um, but I want to make a comment about something you said. So you said how, you know, even like chemistry and, and things like that, you've learned how it relates in the cells and biology relates to movement when you started learning about physical movement that you can see, feel, and touch in the athletic training room, right? In the clinic. And it's interesting that my journey of learning as a student um, to where I'm at now, still as a student, that movement is, is much broader than I ever thought. Like you said, you know, you continue to ask why, why, why you realize, oh man, I don't know anything. (laughs) Um, but you know, movement is even occurring at that level, right? Movement doesn't have to occur at the physical body level. There's movement happening all the time. Like we're, you know, blood's moving through our body constantly right? There's movement happening as air passes through our airways and back out, right? There's all kinds of great, fascinating things happening internally that is involved with the movement, right? And when we stop moving is when we die, right? That's when we cease to exist. And the even funnier is that we're, we're sitting and standing on this giant rock we call earth. That's what? Moving, Right? Oh, like, man. everything is constantly moving so i just have this whole broad idea of like wow okay like movement is not just exercise movement is so much more than that right and again what would happen if this big rock we're sitting on earth stopped moving we would cease to exist <laughs> you know mm-hmm. so it's like man it movement's pretty dang important and, and, and that's why i love the theme of this podcast and this youtube channel is you know, let's talk about movement, right? Let's just take this thing to another level. It's not just fitness and exercise. It's also that. Um, I don't, I don't think I touched on this enough and I want to touch on it really quick before we move on to the, you know, the next question you, you have for this podcast. I don't think I touched on enough, the importance of having multiple coaches, right? It's, it's so important to have people that have different perspectives on you, right? On, on what you need to improve at, on what you need to get better at. And I love using the example of like an athlete, right? And I, tennis is probably one of my favorite ones to use. You know, you have a coach for serving, 
you have a coach for, you know, moving around and, um, making decisions. You have a coach, a mental health coach, you have, you know, a coach for different areas of your game. Uh, you have a fitness coach, you have a athletic trainer, you know, um, health coach. Uh, so you have all these coaches for all these different areas of your game just to make you a, a, a better, uh, athlete. Right. And the same thing is for a student, right? You need multiple coaches. You need multiple perspectives. You need people to look at you through different lenses and give you feedback to make yourself better. Because there's a lot of things that you don't see about yourself that you're still learning as a student, um, that, that you need to know and information that you're not going to get on your own without accepting multiple coaches. It doesn't mean you don't know anything. It, it, you know, you shouldn't affect your pride to ask people for help. It shouldn't affect your pride to say, I don't know. You know I, I love saying, I don't know. I'm super excited about that. You know, I'm excited to learn from you guys all the time. And that leads me to like what you said earlier about how I, really do take it seriously to learn from my students. And you're right. Maybe it is a common thing, a theme to, oh, there's, I don't have to learn anything from my students. I've, I've done this longer than they have and whatever. But a lot of times, you know, when you're doing your job, you're just seeing the same thing and doing the same thing over and over again. Of course, sometimes you, maybe you're a good clinician, you've read research and change things up a little bit, but a lot of times somebody with a perspective of growing up in another part of the world and how they treated medicine and injuries. Somebody with a perspective of growing up under a professional athlete, mother or father, somebody with the perspective of growing up really poor and they had to improvise to, you know, provide treatment and stuff like that. Right. They all have so much knowledge and information to be provided to our field that can help so much people. And the reason why I feel like this long is because I myself, when I first became a student, I didn't even know what athletic training was. I had no idea. It's like, wow, there's actually somebody exists that can treat injuries and do something about it. Like I never did anything about it. Here's what I did about it growing up, right? And my family for generations, this is what we've all ever known and done. And so when I saw people treating injuries after they were injured, it blew my mind as a student. And you know, again, I, who am I, right? I'm just a student. I have, don't have nearly the knowledge that people above me have, but I was seeing this and like pretty upset that. So you mean to tell me that this, this profession, we're just going to wait until people get hurt and then apply these things to them. Like, that's how this job goes. Like, you're not going to try to like work ahead to like, <laughs> you know, help these people beyond that. And like, it I just, it was not tying to my head. And there's amongst other things, a lot of things I will tell you <laughs> that didn't make sense to me. And I was scared to speak up about it. I was scared to ask about it because I felt like I would be diminished or told, no, that's just not what this profession does. Right. But I think that's so wrong. I think we need to have an open mind and accept all opinion and new perspectives coming in, especially I value the most people that know the least about my field, especially them. So I think there's such great knowledge to be had uh, from any individual, not just students pursuing to be an athlete trainer or physical therapist or anything in this field. So that's, I really wanted to touch on those things. So thank you for giving yeah. me, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to, to do that. Yeah. I will add though, that I thought you said what's pretty cool on the note of movement is that when I started um, drawing these parallels between my school work and my personal interests in movement, I started taking more neurobiology classes. And I know you talked about this once, but the piezo channel is something I actually learned about in neurobio. And just the fact that at the molecular level, these different strings of amino acids make this specific confirmation due to their like hydrophobic polar properties, they create this channel that mechanically stretches and opens up like an actual channel and closes mechanically activated when you press on it with all these tr uh, different transmembrane domains. It's pretty amazing that even these molecules abide by these principles of movement. And that's how everything is sort of, um, sort of everything works, right? 
you know, by by these principles of structure leads to function and this the importance of movements that follows that. Dude, patterns, man, not parts. Patterns, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you can't, in my field, you cannot see an ankle injury and just treat the ankle. Like, if what you just said is true and what you just said we know about and we've known about for a long time, <laughs> It's funny because the people that probably know about that and discover that and we've known about it for a long time, like nothing, no big deal. Oh yeah, I knew that already. It's it's so funny because I wish, you know, years ago when that was discovered, they would have had the conversation with a clinician like me. You know, I mm-hmm. wish they would have just, oh my God, let me talk to these people that deal with physical ailments and let them know this amazing information. <laughs> It'll probably change the way they treat and it will. But it's funny because there's a disconnect between there's a there's a huge disconnect right now and a big problem in my field that is currently being addressed, which is really cool. But there's a big, huge disconnect between the researchers and the questions they're asking and the clinicians and the questions they need to be asked. Right? There's so much research and articles published and and done and spent money on tons of funding that get answered. And the results and the answers are almost always not applicable to the the clinician and the clinic, the workplace that we're at, the setting that we're at. And so it's almost like a waste. It's like, oh, great. You found this great information on this topic and this thing, but it means nothing. So it's like, oh, man. So I, I'm just on this mode to find those people that know way more than I will ever know about what you just talked about, right? The piezo channels, the movement of the cells, the mechanical changes that occur physiologically within, right? Those are things that you you would think are very important for a clinician to know when I'm dealing with someone going through the healing process or when I'm dealing with someone who I'm trying to prevent an injury and improve their performance at. But we don't, right? We don't. We're so obsessed with the big red belly muscles memorizing all the names of the anatomy, right? We have, we spend most of our time doing that. We spend most of our time learning the same 10 exercises to strengthen the same 10 muscles that we find on everybody that's weak. And we're okay with that. We're satisfied with that. We're okay with slapping an ice bag and using electrical stimulation, right? Even though the evidence is not very strong for it, right? We're okay with that. And I'm not okay with that. <laughs> and it's it's very frustrating. But in a lot of ways, it's none of the clinicians' faults, right? There are other barriers and other things that are causing that, but that's another topic for another day. <laughs> no, yeah. But I, I do gather from that um that being open-minded is very important hmm. to being a good student and being um open to new research and reevaluating and being present in when you're uh, researching on your own and making sure you internalize that new knowledge and being accepting that you could be wrong and your prior treatment methods may not be up to date to the current standards mm-hmm. of the research. And Dude, my, my, my favorite topic is space. <laughs> I love space. And it is, it makes sense. Like, we're dealing with gravity all the time, especially we even use gravity in some of our muscle manual testing uh, grading scales. We even use gravity to progress resistance on certain tissues in certain areas. And it's funny because you, you brought up asking why, and nobody's ever asked, you know, why, you know, like gravity, <laughs> like <laughs> what do we do when we have less gravity or more gravity is there such thing as that you know can we go to the tallest peak on earth and is there less or more of it it's like you know how would our body react to that why are we struggling to send astronauts to space and to have the appropriate exercise and they have to return to earth earlier because we can't survive in that doesn't that interest people you know i feel like there's knowledge and information to learn there that could benefit people here on earth right now and the gravity that we live in right now so dude yes open mind right have a great conversation with other people and every other subject you could think of and apply it this is movement we're talking about right 
we're we're mm-hmm. talking about movement here. It's it's essential for life. Um, so it, you can really take it any direction you want. And I think it is a way it, it has missing pieces that we're not utilizing because we're okay with just doing what we've always done. Hmm. So my next question, I think you've we've already sort of moved towards this direction, but my question was what makes a successful clinician? And so I think we already tackled one of those, which is being uh, open-minded and being willing to accept that perhaps some of your methods are out of date or perhaps you're doing well, but what else do you think makes a good clinician? All right, here's what makes a good clinician. The number one rule for every clinician, number one, is to do no harm. Number one. So when I'm dealing with a patient, I always make an effort to ask them what their goals are and what their needs are. Right. I think that's also very important to practice patient centered care. But once you find that out and you begin your journey towards that, you want to make sure that as you guide them along the path, that Every decision you make, even if it's within the one session that you're dealing with somebody one-on-one, you want to steer them away from harm, right? If it means that I'm going to gain two times more, but I'm going to get one step back, you know, because of harm, then I'm going to choose not to do that, right? So the number one thing to makes that makes a good clinician successful clinician is to do no harm and along with that goes practicing evidence-based practice which involves one of the components which is patient-centered care i think there's a lot of times that we don't look at the individual and their needs uh, or their disabilities or impairments or whether that's mental or physical uh, their situation, their upbringing, their movement history, I like to call it their movement timeline, right? All of that plays a huge factor, right? The number one cause of injury, I say it all the time, previous injury, right? So you got to know your patient, right? You cannot just say, oh, this injury, diagnose it. Oh, I usually give these three exercises for that, fix everybody up. No, that's just not how it goes. That's unfair to the patient. Um, The other thing I would say is that once you understand their goals, this is what else makes a good clinician is to, before you return them to their activity, to their job, to their work, to their sport, whatever it is, (laughs) you got to see them do it. (laughs) Like that's like, remember I was talking earlier about when I was a student and learning this stuff for the first time and realizing I was doing observation hours and realizing, Oh my God, this is a profession. This is amazing. You just watch sports and like people actually it's like, I, I feel like the patients, the, the athletes, the people, like, I feel like they were so spoiled. I'm like, Oh my God, I didn't even, I need to tell my parents when I get home, this exists. <laughs> my dad's having like back pain or my mom. And right. So, um, but I never saw anybody I never saw anybody do anything remotely close to the activity that they were trying to return them to. It was, mm. hilarious. It was hilarious to me. It's like, oh, okay, this basketball athlete, you know, is having knee pain and they're a center. So, okay, centers get a lot of rebounds, right? So they're jumping up and landing a lot, especially in practice. The coach is making them do a lot more drills of, you know, touching the backboard and back down and, you know, outlet passes and things like that. They start to drill throwing off the ball off the backboard, right? You got to grab the rebound, make a decision. So I thought it was funny that we were treating the knee with all these modalities, which is fine. I want to make clear, everything has its place in medicine, right? Every modality, every intervention has its place in medicine. There's not one thing that I hate or wouldn't ever use myself, okay? But it's okay. So we're doing these modalities and these things to treat this pain, treat this injury. We put them through this rehab process as the weeks go by on their back. They're doing the same exercises I see everybody do uh, again, which is fine. Has its place in medicine. Okay. But then they're like, okay, no more pain. Yeah, no more pain. All right. Let me test your strength, test your strength on the table. Right. 
maybe watch them like stand up, maybe, maybe watch them stand up, like do a squat or something, maybe. And then after that's like, all right, you're good to go play coach. He's good. Yep. Awesome. And then they go back out there and it's like, Oh, it's back again. It's not as bad, but it's, it's back again, you know? And I just think that like every patient or athlete out there, you need to be demanding more than that. Right. I think it's time to start holding us accountable and start demanding that we test as close as possible as we can, can as close as possible as we can in the controlled settings that we have of the clinic and recreate the activity, recreate the thing that is causing them pain, recreate the thing that is causing them impairment or dysfunction. Right. And then utilize your interventions and tools and then retest whatever that thing was grabbing a rebound and landing, right? I'm going to get him out to the basketball court, watch him do, get a rebound. He's going to be, Oh, I knee hurts. Okay. Let's go back to the clinic. Let's do some stuff. Send him back out there. Let me see you get a rebound again. Does it feel better? No. Okay. Let's go back. It wasn't that right. Instead of just like, I did that thing and then sent him home with that. And it didn't even improve at all. 10%, 30% didn't pursue, improve their pain at all. So I think as clinicians, we need to do a better job of making decisions on what interventions we're going to be using by testing functional activities or the exact activity that caused the injury or pain, or that is causing the injury and pain, retest it in the controlled setting as best as we can, get them to be pain-free and functional, right? Out of dysfunction in that movement pattern, whatever it may be. And then test them in an uncontrolled setting before we get them back to play. And by uncontrolled setting is not putting them on a pad or bouncy ball on one leg, throwing the ball around like, God, no, like make the uncontrolled setting as realistic as possible, right? Challenge Mm -hmm. all of their senses, right? I want loud noise in a basketball game. I want them doing it on the hard floor with their basketball shoes on. I want them having somebody push them as they jump up, having somebody jump up and contest to get the rebound with them. Um, Having someone scream for the ball for them after they get it and they can hear them screaming from the left or right side of the court and they know which way to pivot and turn to make that pass, right? I want all that stuff. That's what I want. I don't want somebody to be in a clinic on a blue Airax pad (laughs) challenging stability on that leg. No, 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 no. I I think we need to do a better job of that. So I think that is more related to the physical side of what you're asking Mm -hmm. uh, makes a good successful clinician, but there's just one more thing I would like to say, and it's unrelated to more of the physical side to treat everyone with respect. (laughs) I know that may not be the answer you're looking for. Maybe the audience either, but if you're a patient or you're wanting to be a clinician, (laughs) I think this might even be number two behind the do no harm, but you want to treat everybody with respect. Patient perception is number one, right? I I think that the reason why we have patient centered care is because everybody has a different perception of their pain level of their own personal movement. Um, And I think that should be our priority as a clinician when we're treating anybody. Patient perception Mm -hmm. is really where it's at. So that's why I like to utilize what I described as testing the movement that they perceive causes them pain, that they perceive is a problem. And then apply the intervention, retest that thing that they perceive is a problem And now their perception is going to be changed. Oh, I am on board with this activity because it took away the thing that was causing me all those problems. My perception has now been changed, right? It's not about, it's it's not about muscles or anatomy or movement. It's about patient perception, right? Mm -hmm. Once, Once I can coach that patient to feel and understand their own body more, I've reached my goal as a clinician. It's not about strengthening people. It's not about 
any of that stuff. It's mm-hmm. about helping the person to change their perception, right? And I think we have to treat everybody with respect, starting with calling them by their name, uh, using their appropriate pronouns, understanding their movement history, like we talked about, understanding their eth- ethnicity and their cultural background. I think all of those things we have to keep in mind when we're treating a patient. And I think they're far superior than anything physical that we're doing with anybody. Hmm. I guess I think, I think a lot of what you're saying follows with uh, this sort of mantra I've heard before, which is treat the person, not the injury. Mm-hmm. And so people tend to give like a, or what I've seen in some uh, physical therapy clinics is they'd give a cookie cutter approach to every person's like injury. Like you get a ton of knee replacements and everybody gets the same um, treatment. It, I mean, knee replacement may not be the best example, but say someone has a chronic knee pain and they all get the same treatment, but really through a comprehensive assessment and learning about that person's individual needs and through testing, can you figure out what specific intervention can help them through testing and retesting and see what, see if we can get any buy-in from the actual patient. You know, when they feel, when they notice that this specific intervention has reduced the pain, then it empowers them to know that they have some control over their pain and that gives them options, you know? And then that comes with a lot of education. You know, it's the responsibility of the clinician, I guess, to go through school and develop the knowledge to pinpoint what the core cause of the problem is. And most of the time, it's not just this specific muscle. It's normally a movement problem. And I think something I thought of when you were speaking on was, was that a lot of the treatment methods that we see traditionally are kind of misguided in that say you had have someone balancing on the Airx pad and it may not be that that might not translate to actual the actual movement that they're doing day to day right and so say you have somebody squatting on a boxing ball i've seen this a ton of times at the commercial gym right can that person even squat their own body weight without their knees caving in and their feet and their foot arch collapsing because if they're not able to do that proper body weight squat why are we adding that unstable surface of the bosu ball right it's supposed to challenge stability per se but in reality do you have stability of your hips are you able to create external rotation torque at the hips while keeping your foot grounded balanced throughout Um, your entire foot maintaining an arch are you able to do that and then maybe you can consider the boxy ball as a balance exercise and not and so I think a lot of this these treatment methods need to be reevaluated for their their validity and focusing it on the patient's goals Mm -hmm. I'd say I think this is a good opportunity to talk about or to say that I believe is my opinion that there is no wrong movement, right? You mentioned like knees caving in. I don't think knees caving in are like evil (laughs) or like bad, right? I think like it's actually important, right? If you look at like uh, alignment in football, what if they get hit from the side when they're not looking and their knee has to cave in? I'm going to want them to go further caved in to spin out of that thing right? And survive without tearing their knee, right? So I think there's an opportunity in, 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 in life where we need our knees, knees to cave in, right? Um, so I don't think any movement is, is bad. I think we have movements and we have an awesome understanding as clinicians in our field of what movements are more efficient, but I don't think any movement is bad and that we should 100% avoid because they're going to experience it on the football field. They're going to experience it in in life and anything, right? 
people are going to experience these poor positions that we try to avoid when we're training. And it's ironic because if we do that, we're not prepared for them when they happen in an uncontrolled environment and setting. Now, with that being said, you know, you talked about balancing on the BOSU ball. There's not many times in our life that we're going to be walking through the grocery store, the supermarket with the ground and every aisle being soft, bouncy and cushiony where I'm having to balance to grab, you know, my, <laughs> my food from the top shelf. Right. Or this is going to be, you know, limited times where I'm walking back to my car in the parking lot on a parking lot. That's like super wobbly and bouncy. And I don't really know of any sports besides maybe that trampoline basketball <laughs> where the court or the surface is like bouncy ground. Right. So if we're not really ever exposed to that type of surface or environment, then maybe you could argue there is some purpose or some time to be training that, right? I think there is some benefit to train on different surfaces and there's some carryover to the surface that you're on. That's okay. But I think to have that as your test to return to play and activity, I don't think that, I think we could do better on that. So I think you're right. We need to have, we need to make sure the person can stabilize on firm ground on two feet. And then we can progress from there. And preferably we progress more towards their sport or their activity that they're going to be and the surface and the environment that they're going to be in. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good opportunity time to say that like, Hey man, there's, there's no good, there's no bad movement. I love all movement. And I think it all mm -hmm. serves, serves a purpose. Yeah. Um, but so there's that. I guess the direction I was going more so with that is that you want everybody to have, you want them to have as many options as possible. You want to build capacity. And so if somebody's unable to control like their knee movement and keep that external rotation torque, then that's a, that's a problem, right? I think just because I come from a powerlifting background and it's very goal oriented towards specific movements, we know what is more efficient or effective in terms of form and technique, typically. Right. In most mm -hmm. cases, there's always people that are a little bit different, but these are the primary tenets that we use. And when you create that external rotation torque, you get more out of the hips and you're able to press off of something solid. But that doesn't mean that you should be able to produce force in other positions. In fact, when people go for max attempts, that's when some of these problems show out, but that's only a one time occurrence. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, I remember in the past, in personal, we've talked about the kinesiopathological model to treatment. And it sort of, it's, it follows that cumulative insults to sort of movement or movement problems can lead to micro traumas or lead to problems over time. And I think the thing with that is that if you're constantly doing the exact same movements, the exact same every time, with no variety, that in itself can lower or squeeze your capacity. And so there's, there's, you can sort of learn a lot by expanding that and not sticking to those few movements like powerlifting is. And although it's something that I really love, I know it's not exactly the best for you because you're sticking to movements almost strictly in the sagittal plane you're not moving much transverse plane not moving much horizontal plane and that doesn't um that doesn't set you up for moving at other sports just because you get stiff but it's something i'm aware of and i think building the capacity of uh your patience is very important i have a lot to say okay first off if you're listening to this podcast i hope you're enjoying our conversation so far and if I were you, I'd rewind back to the beginning of Long's soliloquy that he just had right now, because he just defined athleticism without even trying. <laughs> so for everybody listening that uh, aren't athletes, aren't training for a sport, or you know, if your children aren't necessarily athletes, they're just studying school and they're not really interested in that type of stuff. We're not saying by athlete, I want you to be in athletics. We're saying that being athletic means being healthy. 
we're saying that not just in sport, you can go through movements that you need to be physically literate in, in order to keep your body healthy. So being athletic is not training yourself to be better at sport. Being athletic equals health. Being athletic means you're maintaining your body's health. That's number one. Second thing I want to say is I forgot. (laughs) Um, Oh, here's what it is. Um, You were saying how training in weightlifting isn't necessarily healthy is what you were talking about because you're doing the same movements over and over and over again. Right. And you're, and you're training that power lifting or a power lifting, excuse me. Yes. Yeah. And I would say disclaimer, everybody turn up the volume right here. This is very important. If you're taking notes, write this down. Sports are not meant for us to be healthy. I know that sounds crazy, but sports were not created for us to be healthy. Sports is just a fun activity that gets us to be active, but it's by far, you know, athletes by far are not the healthiest people on the planet, right? We see it all the time. They have so many injuries and and problems. They're almost always in pain, uh, fighting through stuff. And I'm not saying sports is bad and we shouldn't do it, right? But I'm just saying that, you know, whether you're, you're powerlifting or any sport, you know, you shouldn't feel like it's just powerlifting, right? It's every sport. If, if you're a volleyball player and you're just hitting with your right arm all the time in games, and obviously to get better at that, you got to hit with your right arm in practice, right? Then yeah, you're going to wear it down. Right. And that's why you hear a lot of what has been popular when I was, since even when I was growing up from what I know of is that cross training, right? Off season, I'm going to do ballet or swimming or some other sport in the off season. Right. And I think that's cool. I think that's, that's pretty awesome, but I think we can do better than that. I think we could be doing stuff in the in season. Right. And one of these baseball coaches I worked with in Fresno was pretty amazed because he had a lot of his hitters, um, hitting the way that they hit during the game. And I was telling him kind of what you're saying now to have, have like more of a symmetrical balance of our tissues and our neurology, et cetera. Right. And our motor patterning. And so I was like, Hey man, have them hit on the other side. It's going to feel awkward. Probably not going to hit the ball. Probably not going to hit the ball far, even if they do make contact with it, but have them swing as hard as they can that way. And a lot of that is because they're still developing. That's why I said that. We'll talk about that later. Anyways, he emails me and texts me back like, you know, a couple of weeks later is like, Oh my God. Like I tried what you said with this one kid and he hit a home run in this next game. He's never hit a home run in his life. His parents are like signed up for, you know, I'm booked out for the rest of the month with lessons with this kid. Thank you so much. And like, really all it was, was that this kid was going, was very physically literate on one side and not the other side and was therefore becoming asymmetrical, which we know is the number two leading cause of injury asymmetry and, and, and was heading down the road of not developing to developing athleticism, which is health, not for sport. And his performance was also down, but when he matched both sides, he unlocked so much potential, so much power, so much speed into his dominant side by training his non-dominant side that we, we, um, kind of get the best bang for our buck, right? We improved his performance and also ensured uh, his health. We helped kept his health intact. And so there you go. So if you if you really enjoy powerlifting and that's what you want to do or whatever sport or activity you do, do not stop doing it. Please keep doing it. If it makes you happy and it makes you feel good, do it, right? But make sure that you have a steady dose of working on the non-dominant side. You have a steady dose. If your activity is more power specific, you have a steady dose of coordination activities, balance activities. You have a steady dose of various amounts and types of movement, right? And I think that's what equals health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess in that sense, specifying too much specifying too soon especially at a young age doing 
only these specific movements rather than broadening your scope and opening your mind up to all of these different movement options and all of these di- and bringing the coordination in the different parts. Because mm-hmm. I know um, uh, Dr. Kelly Stora in his book, The Supple Leopard, he talks about, um, and I've, I'm still uh, in the beginning of reading that book, but he talks about how you can learn a lot from sports as well. Like say the sport of Olympic lifting, when you're in the snatch or the clean, doing a clean and jerk, a lot of those positions, they help you learn to have physical competency when you're moving throughout your day. Because if you're snatching like 300 pounds, then you know how to be in a stable overhead position, right? And this this can help you, like say you're like uh, a, like climbing a tree or something, you're able to create that force and reach up and get in a good scapular position and use your mid back muscles and pull up and create powerful force and lift your body up doing so. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just that like the being specific is bad also, but you can learn a lot from just doing a lot and making sure you're not stagnant and moving and challenging yourself to new movements you may not be comfortable with, right? So in powerlifting, I guess, my problem is that I'm doing a lot of the exact same movements. And so I need to be able to switch those up and program different movements, such as some overhead press movements or going into like, say, a front rack position that that may require a certain amount of overhead position or lap flexibility that is definitely not required for for your bench press or your deadlift or your squats you know mm-hmm. and so yeah and and, just being aware of that yeah and, and when you change up the movements it doesn't mean like a totally different posture or position either right it also means the 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 duration of the activity right do it really slow and see what happens i bet that's going to kill you right and do it really slow on the way down right how about you pause at the top and and carry that instead of having holding it and then putting it right back down how about you carry it right that's something that's more functional and, and designed to how we're supposed to be using our shoulder and our upper body um so i would say that you know, we t- you've been talking a lot about capacity, right? Capacity is under is is being able to perform that snatch, but how many times can you perform that snatch before you begin to lose integrity be- due to fatigue of your body, right? So, however many reps you can do, however long you can carry it before you gotta change positions because you're losing integrity of your form because of fatigue, that's your capacity. And so you want to train up to that and not beyond, not beyond fatigue. You don't want to train beyond a form that has been altered because you can no longer be in that position or hold that weight or perform any more Mm -hmm. reps, which is funny to say, because in your sport, that's pretty much what you have to do in your sport, which is fine. Go ahead and do that, but make sure you're supplementing that with some carries because your sport is very explosive one time and done, right? So what I would say to supplement that is on the flip side, one time and hold it, Mm -hmm. carry it, carry it, walk around. And when you start to fatigue in a certain position, move it in another position. When you start to fatigue in that position, switch arms or change positions again, start to turn Mm -hmm. your head. Start to challenge your sensory motor system. You know, close your eyes, have loud music, stand on a straight, walk on a straight line. You know, so there's so many, there's an unlimited amount of ways. I just named a few that you can make your activities more variable without actually having to even change the movement. You can still Mm. do the, you can still do the same movement, right? So I would say to uh, go through your movements really slow build as much capacity as you can in your movements through carries moving really slow and not losing integrity. And then come back to me and let me know if your lifts increase. I bet they will. I hope so. (laughs) Yeah. I I bet they will. I bet they will. So uh, just, 
just something I thought of while you were speaking was um, a very important uh, tenant when it comes to trading for uh, any uh, for barbell sports in particular is to train until technical failure in that you want to train like you're saying with the snatch example you don't want to get to the point where you're fatigued and you start losing correct positioning that's when you've already failed per se and so in my sport when we're doing our reps and sets we want to go and we only count the reps and sets that we can do with proper technique and form and we get when we get beyond that the added training volume or intensity isn't worth the risk Mm -hmm. per se and Mm -hmm. so when you're going for max attempts at a competitive meet you're actually going for not your true maxes. You're going below that to where you know you're able to hit it and Mm. do so confidently. Because you have three attempts at each lift, when you get to the third attempt, you're going to be gassed either way. And so you know it's not going to be your gym PR that you hit like in in training without having to squat and bench the same day because deadlifting is the last movement when you compete, right? And so you're being conservative. And when you do go for those absolute true maxes you're you're prepared for it right you've been working for this you've been peaking your fatigue is low and so it's a calculated risk and you have lots of spotters etc and so there's a lot that goes into this yeah and then another thing i thought of and this is like going back to the the initial question of what makes a successful clinician and it was um you mentioned the example of tennis where they have a bunch of different coaches. And I think part of my answer is to what makes a successful clinician is, and a good student in general is, is someone who's able to synthesize the knowledge for multiple fields. Right. And so you mentioned how you may have a clinician that only has someone saying laying supine and just doing or sitting supine doing, say, leg extensions or something, right? But the strength and conditioning coach is actually going to have them use their quads and do a squat, right? And so a really good clinician is able to synthesize the knowledge from strength and conditioning, from physical therapy, from uh, psychology, and be excellent in all those fields and try and progress the patient in the best way possible, right? Be kind to them, call them by their name, remember their names, right? Be be very specific when you get to that point into the return to sport, right? Don't just treat them in the clinic, right? Um, I mentioned with you in private before that I see sort of treatment as like a spectrum where strength and conditioning and physical therapy, athletic training is sort of like on this gradient and they're really tackling the same problem, right? And so when we get to this further end, we're seeing them at the actual sport, but maybe after the total knee replacement, we do really only need them to do that leg extension because we need to return that terminal uh, knee um, end range after that surgery, you know? Mhm. Exactly. Yeah, I mean we're we're all reaching the same goal and I just wish we all worked together more. <laughs> like that would help our professions a lot, but hey, whatever. This is where we're at. So, yeah. Uh is there any other things you have to add before we end this podcast for our viewers? Um I don't think so. <laughs> all right, cool, man. I think we hit it all until next time. I mean, we could probably keep going for another hour or two, <laughs> but I think our viewers need a little break. So so we'll go ahead and uh, call it a day for episode three. Long, it was a pleasure having you and having this uh, discussion with you. We talked about some important topics and you really opened up my mind to to unleash a lot of my thoughts and I appreciate you and thank you for that. Of course. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I learned a lot too. I'll be re-watching this and thinking more about the things we discussed. <laughs> All right. Right on, man. Okay. Well, I'll, she, I'll hopefully see you for future podcast episodes and we'll go from there. All right. Thanks long. <laughs>